Good morning, church. We're so glad you're here this morning. When you can, just stand to your feet and worship with us.
secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now stay in your shadow this morning, in your presence. You are the God of revival. We need revival in this land today. Let's sing about a church. city, over our state, over this nation, over the world this morning. Let's sing. Come awaken your people. 
come awaken the city. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. I hear the chains hit the ground. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awaken your people, come awaken the city. Oh, God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stone will crumble. I hear the change in the
Let it start with us. Let it start with us today. You said, if my people who are called by my name, not any group of people outside the walls of the church, not sinners that are doing their own thing, who don't give God any regard whatsoever. You said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. God, let it start with us today. Let it start in our own homes, the homes of those who call themselves your children. Let it start with us. Revival has to begin. Repentance has to begin at the house of God. God, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace in this place today. Search our hearts, oh God. See if there's anything in us, God, that doesn't line up with what you would have us do. God, we want to see our land healed. We want to see our nation heal. We want to see this world come to know you. It has to start with us today. God, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your mercy, your grace. I pray, God, that you would let our hearts be open to receive your word today. Let our minds be clear of all the clutter and madness going on around us. And let us just lean into you this morning and just learn of you. We give you thanks. We give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, and all the church said, Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to New Covenant, whether you're here in the room or you're joining us online today. We're so glad that you're here. And uh, if you want to go ahead and, and get ready to jump in, turn to Matthew chapter 5 with me, uh, whether in your Bible, smartphone, whatever you got. And uh, man, we'll, we're just going to dive in. We're in this series called Detox. And I, I realize that that series, that, that word in a series would make you think that we're going to talk about Maybe some kind of substance detox or something that you've put in your body as a, a food or a drink or maybe alcohol, drugs or something, anything to do with that. And you would say, well, we're going to talk about how to detox from that. And that's the reality for that word for those things. But for our purpose, we've been walking through these statements that Jesus made. And for our purpose of detox, we are walking through these statements in the hopes that we will have our thinking challenged. Because the whole idea of this series with these passages of Scripture is the question, how would the people who, have, who heard it then have taken it? How would the people that heard Jesus say these words, what would have been their response? We talked about blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Last week we talked about blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And so now we're going to dive into this next phrase. And the reality of these statements is when Jesus would have said them, the response from the people would have been, but Jesus, this is the way we've always thought about things. This is the way we've always done this. And Paul sums up this idea that Jesus was trying to get across in the Sermon on the Mount or the Beatitudes or the blessed statements that we've been diving into. Paul sums up the, the, the hope that Jesus had for us in Romans 12, 1 and 2 from the New Living Translation. It reads like this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. 
Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. So this statement that Jesus said and that we're gonna, we're gonna talk through this morning is from Matthew chapter five, verse four. Here's what Jesus said. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Some of you have probably heard some of this story, and I think I shared it a little bit when we were exclusively online for church, but I had a really close friend that died in a house fire uh, with his parents my senior year of high school. And I'll never forget, and thinking back on that moment, and the moment that I stood at our church that Sunday morning knowing that, that he had been found and that that's what had happened and then you know standing at the visitation with their with all our friends and family and then standing at the funeral service I'll never forget the feeling of grief and sorrow that came over me that those days I had never to that point as an 18 year old kid I'd never to that point openly expressed grief and sorrow now, I'm sure there were moments as a child when I didn't get that toy at the store or you know, I didn't get that bat or that set of cle- you know, those cleats or that glove that I wanted and I had what I thought was true sorrow over this moment. But this moment was different. And that, that moment in time is a marker that has set the rest of my life in motion from that point on as it relates to grief. I'll never forget the, the emotion and the weight of sorrow and grief and mourning that I felt in that moment. You see, mourning is a word that we don't really use. We talk about grief, we talk about sadness, we talk about sorrow, we talk about feeling bad, but that word mourn is that feeling that you have that you can't really explain, but it's the deepest sense of sorrow and grief that you've ever experienced. And when we hear the word mourn, we automatically think someone has died and I'm going to be sad. I've walked with many of you through those times in your life 40 or 50 times since I've been at New Covenant I've done that many funerals since I've been here so I've walked with you through your grief and I've heard your pain I've heard your story I've heard what you've dealt with you see to mourn is to express grief or sorrow and we, we, we try to gather our thoughts and our feelings and we, we often forget the humanity of our Savior Jesus who in a moment of grief, wept. He wept. He shed many tears. I mean, you're talking about crying. We're talking about weeping. Over the moment when his friend Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days, and you would say, hey, Josh, why would Jesus have shown grief if he knew that he was going to bring Lazarus back from the dead? Because he arrives late to the party, you know, like this 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 thing he's invited to to heal Lazarus Lazarus ends up dying Jesus waits and then he goes four days late Jesus shows up and he sees the pain and the hurt on the family and the people that are grieving over Lazarus and he sits and he weeps and in this moment we realize that Jesus was a man that wasn't ashamed of his humanity that he could identify with me and you when we face sorrow and grief I think the source of his weeping, the source of his immense mourning and grief were because he loved people and he saw their pain and shared their pain. But it seems obvious for me to stand up here and tell you that in your mourning, Jesus will walk with you. In your grief over the loss of a loved one, over the pain of a lost job, over the pain of a sickness or some bad news or any number of things that you could face in this life, it seems obvious that I would stand up here today and say, Jesus is with you. Is he? Absolutely. But if we're going to walk through a a season of challenging our thinking, it seems kind of obvious that I would tell you that Jesus would comfort you in your mourning. We know he does. 
In Psalm 34, 18, he says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Folks, Jesus will comfort you in your moment of grief, your sorrow, your pain, your suffering, your storm, your season that you're in. He will stand with you. But when we hear him say, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, he is not talking about losing a loved one. He's not talking about your pain of a situation. He's not talking about the storm that you face in life. You see, if being poor in spirit is about knowing we are nothing without God, then to get to the real root of the problem, Jesus is calling us into a deep state of grief, a mourning before our Heavenly Father about how sinful and fallen we really are. It's not a casual sorrow for the consequences of our sin. It's not, I'm sorry that I got caught or I'm sorry that someone got hurt. No, it's it's about this moment where we truly understand how evil and depraved and awful we are as a human being. You say, well, why is this statement counter to the way of thinking then and now? Because for pretty much the entire human existence, we feel the need to posture our morality. Adam and Eve, from the moment they began in the garden, they sinned, and then all of a sudden they had to prove to God that they were good. All of a sudden, Cain and Abel are faced with giving a sacrifice to God. Abel's is good and accepted by God. Cain's is not accepted by God. So Cain is mad that his morality wasn't justified, so he went and killed his brother. We feel that we must justify our good in order to hide the bad. Now, it was pretty hard for a long time. Really, since Adam and Eve, it was very difficult to show people how good you really were. But the good news is, we have Facebook now. And we have Instagram. And we have Snapchat. And we have Twitter. So now, more than ever, We have been given this beautiful picture, this beautiful reality that we can now posture our morality before the entire world at the click of a button. I would say that social media is the official sponsor of morality posturing. And you're like, what, what? Because here's where our mind goes. Your morality, your good, your life gets questioned. You immediately, did they not see what I posted? Did they not scan the thousands of likes and find my like down at the bottom? Did they not see that verse that I reposted the other day from that person that posted that? We have this obsession with posturing our morality before the rest of the world to make sure that they know how good we are. You know? There might be some people out here that do this. I haven't really seen it, and if you've seen it, then awesome. But you don't see many people saying, well, me and my wife had a huge fight last night, you know? That was pretty bad. And, like, that was the post that they made, and it was a follow-up. Well, man, I got hammered last night. You're like, well, people do do that, okay? No. All you see is the posturing of our morality. And if we're not obsessed with posturing ours, we're most certainly obsessed with making sure that you postured yours correctly. Hello. And I'm I'm, I'm worried. And I was like, man, I, I, I wish there was a Bible verse about social media. Like, God, if you could have just spoken into this existence with this. And lo and behold... God never fails. There's one in here. You're like, oh my word, what is he about to read? I hope it's not a verse I've reposted before. <laughs> and Isaiah 64, 6. It's, it's, it's hard to find. Here's what, here's what the prophet, here's what God said through the prophet Isaiah. We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display 
our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Can you believe that that's in the Bible? That when we display, when we put on display what, how good we are and how, how much, how many verses that we put out, how many things we said or spoke out, how many things that we did, God looks at that and he says, that's not even good enough to wipe up a mess with. You should take that and go somewhere else. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Why? Because like autumn leaves, we wither and we fall. Our sins sweep us away like the wind. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The, the goal when Jesus spoke, blessed are, the, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. He is saying, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to change the way you think, if you're going to do this differently, then the only posture that you should really have is a posture of repentance at how sinful you are, not them. Jesus spoke about this again in Revelation 3 to the church at Laodicea. Many of you might have heard this verse or somebody quoted this verse to you about lukewarm water and somebody spitting it out of their mouth but in an attempt to rattle the people of this church in the revelation Jesus says this these are the words of the amen the faithful and true witness the ruler of God's creation I know your deeds that you are neither hot nor cold I wish you were one or the other so because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, well, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. But you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You're like, ouch, Jesus. Why would you say such mean things to me? Because we're awful people. Because we have sin in our heart. Because all the righteous acts that we can do, all the things that we can stand up and do and be and, and, and say and, and try to teach and, and talk about how good we really are, are worthless in comparison to how bad we really are. And we don't see it. We don't see it. And the contrast is shocking for me on my own life. What I think about myself versus what I really am what I see and what Jesus really sees. And so there was this moment where Jesus was faced with a blind man. And this young man had been ridiculed from birth because surely his parents had sinned and that was the reason why he was blind from birth. Surely your parents screwed up. They did something wrong in their life, and that's why, you're, that's why you're blind now. He comes to Jesus. Jesus, you know, in a definitely anti-social distancing way, spits in the ground and makes some, some, some spit and um, rubs it on the guy's eyes. And when he opens his eyes, he can now see for the first time in his entire life. This man leaves Jesus and he goes back to the village and he goes back to where the, all the people are and, and everybody starts to say, what happened? Who healed you? Why, why can you see now? And he says, this guy, man, it, he, he came, he, he spit in the ground, he made some mud out of it, he rubbed it on my eyes and, and I can see now. Like, well, who did it? What was his name? What's he about? You know, where, where did he come from? Like, did he do it on Sunday? You know, like, and these people, these church people, were so distracted and so, so taken back by somebody that would be healed like this, a miracle this powerful, that they found, they found a way to ridicule and said, well, Jesus did that on the Sabbath. He doesn't honor God's day, and so he must be of the devil. I'm like, what? You can't celebrate with this guy that's been blind his whole life, and now he can see? They went to his parents. They're like, but what happened? You ex Explain it to us. And the parents, they're like, he's old enough, ask him. They didn't want to say the wrong thing. 
They don't want to get in trouble. And finally, the guy says, I don't know what you want from me, but here's what I know. I was blind, and then I can see. I was blind, and now I can see. And they ridicule this, this man so much that they, that they, they kick him out. They, they, they shoo him away and says, man, like, you're worthless. I don't, we, we, we can't talk to you anymore. And then Jesus saw what was going on. And in John 9, 35 through 41, he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Jesus went and found this man that they threw out when he healed. And he said, who is he, sir? Tell me, said, I'm going to believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Here's what I'm learning about my blindness. When I walk away from mourning over how sinful I really am. And I begin to walk away from what Jesus has done for me. I begin to ask questions like they asked. The Pharisees looked at Jesus after he said that he was coming to make the blind see and those who will see will become blind. They said, what? You talking about us? You talking about me? I know you just didn't say I was blind to this. I know you're not calling me out, Jesus. Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Folks, we're blind. We are sinful. We are broken. We are wretched. We are pitiful. And if we're going to truly walk how God would have us to walk and live how he would have us live, then we would come to a place of godly sorrow. That we would mourn over how depraved and evil our heart is and that without Jesus we would be nothing. Paul speaks of this in 2 Corinthians 7.10. He says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. I don't know about, I don't know about you. I just want you to close your eyes for a moment. I need you to take a moment just between you and God and I need, to, I need to say this. I have um, really in my entire life, probably in my entire time at, as a pastor in ministry, I've never been more lost on what to do in my entire life. I have never been more confused about what to say or what to do. And I began to pray. I've been praying. Hey, hey God, would you... um? Would you just show me the way? God, would you show me where I'm blind? Would you show me my blind spots? Would you, would you wipe the scales from my eyes? Would you help me to transform the way I think? Would you, would you replace my heart of stone with a heart of compassion? Would you create in me a clean heart, oh God? And then I began to pray, God, would you just show me how to lead? Would you show me how to guide and direct and be what you want me to be? And in that moment, just felt this sense of God's presence and he said of course of course people are sinful of course there's evil 
Uh, Of course there's pain. Of course there's suffering. Of course there's gossip. Of course there's lying and cheating and stealing. Of course people have no regard for me. Josh, I warned you about this. Josh, I told you so many times in my word that people would turn from me. Josh, I I warned you in scripture so many times. I tried to let you see it. I tried to let all of humanity see that even those that think they have it together are some of the most spiritually blind people to walk this earth. And Josh, the only hope starts in your heart. So I want to challenge each of you to do that this morning. I want to challenge each person in this room to search your heart. Let godly sorrow and grief and mourning flood your soul over the condition of your sinfulness. Say, I'm not a sinner, I'm free, I'm forgiven. Yes, you are. But you're still a broken humanity. You're still living a broken world. And that brokenness will only heal when we walk through the gates of heaven. And we need Jesus every day to show us the way. Lord, this morning I just pray for an overwhelming sense of your power and presence in our heart. God, would you help us to stop being defensive when someone accuses us of being blind? Or God, when someone looks at us and challenges our thinking or challenges our way of life. God, that we would begin to think differently about the way that you would think. God, that we would truly become broken over our sinfulness and our humanity. And that we we would be reminded that there is really no other way except through you. God, would you just speak to our heart this morning? God, give us the strength to walk in your way so that we can be the light that we need to be. And then, God, would you call us into the space of helping to change people's lives. God, would you call us out into those moments where we need to step up and to be your light and to show your love and your compassion and your grace and mercy to those in, the, in our world. God, use us for your glory so that more people will know of who you are and can spend eternity with you. We love you this morning. We're so thankful for the time that we've shared. Thank you so much for your love and your grace in our heart that you saw fit to make a way for us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. And the church said together, amen. Amen. If you guys would like to give in person, you can do so at the back of this room. There's a, a box right at the back if you would like to give. If you want to continue doing that online, you're at home, please do so. We're so blessed by your generosity. Have an amazing week. Registration opens at noon tomorrow. We'll see you next Sunday.